Would you join me uh, this morning for a word of prayer? Loving God, uh, speak to us through our scripture readings this morning, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Two men survived a plane crash, and they were shipwrecked together on a deserted island. And they had two very different attitudes about it. The first one was freaking out and going crazy, saying, nobody's going to find us. We're going to die on this island. It's going to be terrible. We're going to starve. It's going to be awful. And the next one is cool, calm, and collected. And they, he, he says, I will be fine. He says, how can you say that? How can we be fine? He says, well, I'll tell you this. He said, I make $10,000 a week, and I tithe to my church. I have no doubt my pastor is going to find me here on this island. A new minister was standing at the back of the church as folks were walking out and they were greeting him and the people were being very generous as most of you often are saying nice sermon pastor that was a great message this morning Uh, but then one man walked through the line and he said that was a very dull and long and boring sermon pastor a few minutes later the same man appeared back in the line and again he said I don't think you put much preparation into that sermon pastor again he went back in the line and he said you really blew it today you didn't have anything interesting to say this morning pastor and finally the minister couldn't stand it anymore so he got one of the deacons and he said what is the deal with this guy and he said oh don't let that guy bother you he's a little bit slow all he does is he just walks around and he repeats what he hears everybody else saying Father O'Malley answered the phone at his church. Hello, this is Father O'Malley. Father O'Malley, this is the IRS. Can you help us? I can. Do you know a Ted Houlihan? I do. Is he a member of your congregation? He is. Did he donate $10,000 to your church? He will. (laughs) Today is a special day in the life of our church because today is what we call Commitment Sunday here at Woodmont. We are bringing our Spring Stewardship Campaign generations of generosity to a a close. And so if you are a member of Woodmont, we certainly hope that you will prayerfully consider making a commitment to support the mission and ministries of our church for another year. If you're visiting our church, we don't expect you to do that. We're never going to stop you from doing that, but uh, we're glad that you're here and we hope that you will keep uh, coming back. We do this every year because commitment is important and we believe in the value of commitment, but we also do it so that we can responsibly plan and set our operating budget for the upcoming year. And, um, and so uh, we will be doing that in the coming weeks. Uh, if you look in your bulletin this morning, you'll see an insert about, how, about a room in the inn, but on the back of that insert, you will see a list of all the different outreach ministries Uh, that we are supporting uh, this year with our budget, and uh, we're very proud of that, and we want to grow that, like I said, in in the announcements. During the month of April, I have been encouraging you to join me in reading Adam Hamilton's book, Enough. I'm even leading a, a discussion class on it for one more week on Wednesday night. But in the revised and updated version of that book, uh, he has a chapter called After the Great Recession, And he asked the question, are you investing in your faith? And he's not just talking about money. He's talking about lots of other things as well. He says investing in your faith is something you do every time you attend a worship service where you sing God's praises, experience God's presence, and listen for God's voice. But that hour a week is not enough in and of itself. Investing in your faith is also what you do when you spend time in prayer, when you talk to and you come to know God. It's what you do when you connect with other Christians in small groups and in Sunday school classes and in fellowship groups. And you describe and discuss your faith and and how it comes alive at different times of your life. Investing in your faith is what you do when you open the Bible and you learn to listen to God speaking through the scriptures. It's what you do when you go out into the world in mission and in ministry. 
Every Sunday when we gather together in this sacred, special place, we are investing in our faith. We are opening ourselves up to the presence of God and allowing God's spirit, God's word, and God's community to shape and mold us in new ways. God is not done with any of us because we are all works in progress, and I think that that's a good thing. Hamilton says many Christians have it wrong. They say that if you give, then God will give more back to you, but that's not how it works. We do not give to God so that we can get something in return, but when we give to God and to others, the blessings seem to come back to us. And I don't know about you, but I've found that to be true in my life time and time again. I've been reading another book this month by a professor at Harvard Business School by the name of Clayton Christensen. And this book is entitled, How Will You Measure Your Life? Back in 2010, Christensen gave the address to the graduating class of Harvard Business School. And at the time, he had just overcome the same type of cancer that took the life of his father. And so in addition to talking about innovation, which is what he is known for in the business community, he also wrestles with some other very important questions, such as, how can I find satisfaction in my career? How can I be sure that my personal relationships become enduring sources of happiness? How can I avoid compromising my integrity as I climb the ladder of success? Christensen addresses these questions and he and he dives deep in this book but this question how will I measure my life is one that we all think about each and every day and it's a very important question what does success look like what does happiness look like what do healthy relationships look like Last week, we talked about what it means to be content and how we can overcome what Hamilton calls restless heart syndrome, this idea that we are never satisfied, that we never have enough, that all we want is more and more and more. Now, it's no secret that our world seems to measure success in certain ways, by money and possessions and fame and prestige and influence and power. And one of the things that Christensen talks about in this book is how when he would go back to Harvard for the reunions of his own business school class, he was noticing a few things. He noticed how lots of people were achieving success by the standards of this world, that being they were making large salaries, they were the CEOs of their companies, they were gaining lots of influence and status, but the problem was that many of them were having some serious problems in their personal lives. They were losing their marriages. They had been through multiple divorces. They had no relationship with their children. The only friends that they had in life were very superficial. And so he talks about this, and that's why he asked the question, how will you measure your life? Because there are different ways for us to measure our lives. Every year, the National Business Journal has an award that they call the Top 40 Under 40 up-and-coming leaders in this community that are making a difference. And we've had a number of Woodmont members in recent years that have received this award. I was humbled to receive it a couple of years ago. But one of the questions that they ask you when they're putting a profile together is this, what would you like to have accomplished before you retire? And the only answer that I could come up with to that question had nothing to do with church Nothing to do with ministry. All that I said is that I would like to have the satisfaction of knowing that I have been a good husband and that I have been a good father. Because truth be told, that is a much more challenging proposition in life than anything we can ever do in our careers. Jesus had a lot to say about how we measure our lives. In fact, His words are incredibly challenging, and they often stand in direct contrast to how the world measures people's lives. 
In Luke 12, he says, Be on guard against all types of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And in life, I have found that lots of people, maybe all of us at times, don't realize that we're being greedy. In Matthew 16, he says, Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. What will it profit them to gain the whole world but to forfeit their lives? In other words, we find our lives by giving and by helping others. And then in our text this morning from John 13, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One way for us to measure our lives is by asking four simple questions, and I've come up with these based on the word life. We can take the L and we can ask ourselves, do we love? Do we love others with a pure heart and with good intentions? And remember, agape love means loving all people, finding the good in all people. For the I, we can ask, do we include others? especially those that often get excluded in the world, the powerless, the marginalized, the weak, the sick, the lonely, those without a voice. For the F, we could ask, do we forgive others for the wrongs that they have done to us? And do we ask forgiveness ourselves for the wrongs that we have done? See, failing to forgive just means that we are carrying around a much larger burden than we have to. Forgiveness can free us from that burden. And for the E, we can ask, are we living just for today or are we living for eternity? Because there's a big difference between the two. These four questions, do we love? Do we include others? Do we forgive and ask for forgiveness? And are we living for eternity is a great way to measure our life and to measure our spiritual life. When I was in college at TCU, I was a double major in religion and sociology. I've always been absolutely fascinated by the ways that human beings interact with each other. And I think Jesus was as well. That's why so many of his teachings are focused on how to treat other people, how to be kind and compassionate to other people. But I do think a lot about all the conflict that exists in our world today, conflict on all levels, and how some people just don't seem to get along with each other. And we all know that there are lots of reasons why human beings don't get along. There's selfishness and there's egos, there's jealousy and rivalry, there's ignorance and envy and greed and fear. But I believe that one of the main reasons that human beings don't get along is that they don't take the time to get to know each other. Because what many people discover when they get to know each other is that they are not all that different. They have a lot in common, and they can, and they should be friends. Love is a word that gets thrown around an awful lot in our culture, but love is the secret, it's the key to understanding the teachings of Jesus. Without love, we have nothing. The Apostle Paul says, And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. In Matthew 7, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. And then in verse 12, he says, In everything, in everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We call this the golden rule, and it's a timeless guideline for living life. I always try to remember that Jesus did not say it in the negative. He didn't say, Don't do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. He said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is much more challenging. It means that we have to be intentional and we have to be proactive. Forgive if you want to be forgiven. Help if you want to be helped. Be merciful if you want others to show you mercy. Listen if you want to be heard. Understand if you want to be understood. Love if you want to be loved. Put others first if you want others to put you first. Pray for others if you want them to pray for you. 
if more people in our world would take the golden rule seriously, then I'm convinced that we would be able to eliminate so many of the problems and so much of the pettiness that happens every day. But the golden rule never happens until we learn to get beyond ourselves. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And guess what? That's not just with our money. That's true with just about anything in life. Our faith, our marriages, our friendships, our careers. The more we put into something, the more we get out of something. This is an age-old truth. And yes, it is possible to commit to too many things at one time. I see it all the time. I've been guilty of doing it myself from time to time. And so setting goals and having priorities and simplifying can be a very good thing. Back in October 2012, Forbes ran an article talking about the top 25 regrets that people had in their life. And I encourage you to, to look up that article because it's very good. But, but the list included these things. Working too much at the expense of family and friends. Losing touch with good friends over time. Not turning off our phones and our computers more often. Not realizing that happiness is a choice. Paying more attention to our marriage. Burying the hatchet with an old friend or family member. Spending more time with children, both when they're young and when they're grown. Taking care of your health at a young age and being a better mother or father. All of these have to do with love and with giving. How will we measure our lives when it's all said and done? How can we live our lives so that we don't have some of these regrets one day? I want to close this morning with the, the words of one of my favorite prayers attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. May it be with us.